Amen. If your soul is not anchored in Jesus, it will surely drift away. Thank you so much for that. I needed, I needed to hear that this day. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, come on and magnify the Lord with me. Because God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. For this is a day that the Lord has made. And we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Indeed, it's a pleasure to be back here. I think this might be my third time, so I'm at home now. Woo, I'm at home. <laughs> I want to thank your wonderful pastor, the Reverend Dr. Gregory Bryant, officers and members, and this, for this opportunity to share a word with you. This amazing music ministry, come on, let's give it up for them. Come on now, you can do better than that. <laughs> What a blessing you are, and I, thanks to my friend and fellow minister, Reverend Dr. Billy Beverly, who stood up, and I see a couple of other familiar faces in here, that God is just good. You know, it's good to have a good sisterhood, is it not? Brotherhood, too, to come and support you. Uh, let us pray. Lord God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. As we read in our text taken from Matthew 14, 22 through 33, we see in this scripture that Jesus demonstrates his majesty of nature by walking on water. In the face of the disciples' fear, Jesus' words in verse 27 perhaps refers to his deity when he says, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. We recall that in Exodus 3, 11 through 15, when Moses says to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God responds, I am who I am. And this is the infinite existence of the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and is to be. Our faith is in him. I am who I am. I, I want to speak to you briefly on the subject. Strong storms require strong faith. And I want to begin by, uh, with this quote by C.H. Spurgeon. It goes as follows. I would recommend you either believe God up to the highest or else not to believe at all. Believe this book. I know there's a book down here. Believe this book from God and everything, every letter of it or else reject it. There is no logical standing place between the two. Be satisfied with nothing less than a faith that swims in the depths of divine revelation, a faith that paddles about the edge of the water is poor faith at best. It is little better than a dry land faith that is not good for much. End of quote. Beloved, we must learn to step out on faith. As Peter did in our text. And as Dr. King said, take a step even when we cannot see the stairs. It doesn't matter how difficult life gets. We must continue to move forward in faith. Because we know that every now and then, uh, we will find ourselves in a storm. It's a part of the human experience, and no one is exempt from it. And we know a lot about changing storms because we live in Michigan, and we know that one minute is sunny and the next may be a rainstorm, maybe a snowstorm. So 
plans for the day have to be changed because of a strong storm. And so it is in life, we can go along just fine for a long time. And then sometimes, suddenly, we find ourselves in a storm. We get a diagnosis that we don't expect. A loved one dies, our finances take a beating due to downsizing or whatever, and our, sp our spouse who once said, I do, now says, I don't, and asks for a divorce. Our teenager may get arrested for drug possession, and these storms can cause us to worry and fret and wonder, well, what will happen now? We've all experienced these types of storms individually in our lifetime, but in 2020, we all experienced a worldwide major storm impacting everyone. Now, we are now post-pandemic, but we remember the number of lost lives. We remember the fear. We remember there was no vaccine at the time, and the country shut down. I know we did here in Michigan. It was a strong storm. And now we find ourselves in a fast-moving political storm. Several weeks ago a, at a campaign rally, there was an assassination attempt on one of our former presidents. One person died and others were injured. Last Sunday, after numerous attempts asking him to step down, our president decided that he would resign and he announced that he was doing it for the good of the country. And now we have a new presumptive Democratic nominee who happens to be a strong black woman. Amen? <laughs> this strong storm is moving swiftly. It is a storm because our country is still divided, very divided. Fear and hate fill the air. And again, Dr. King said, we must learn to live together as brothers or die as fools. And so we find ourselves uh, up against a strong wind, and it doesn't matter what boat you came over here in, we are now in the same boat, trying to weather a strong storm. We now find ourselves in big storms with contrary winds like we have never really seen before. Gun violence with our children is now the number one cause of their death. Gun violence involving police is out of control. When a 36-year-old black woman calls 911 for help and ends up getting shot in the, in the head by the police officer who should have been there to help her, leaving Sonia Macy's two children, with, uh, two, uh, two children without a mother. She said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and, and he shot her. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against evil in high places. And she somehow, it looks like she recognized that. We're up against some strong storms we never seen before, like Project 2025, which if, if it's implemented, would end democracy as we know it. Strong winds, strong storms, like women's rights being taken away and books being banned. What, what, what do we do? What do we do? Well, as I said, we have two options. We can be quiet. We can hide. Uh, in other words, do nothing and, and, and just, you know, hope for the best and don't rock the boat. Or we can exercise uh, strong faith in the face of these turbulent times and take some action. Rapid change is happening, beloved. Uh, uh, you need to get with the program or you will be left behind. And, and beloved, we cannot remain silent spectators in our own life. This is America. This is our future. This is our future generations for our children and their children's future we're talking about. This is not a time to remain silent. So forgive me if I got a little political, but this is the world we live in. Strong faith and strong action are what is required. Yes, 
we must trust in God. Yes, we must pray without ceasing, but we also must take some action. And if we look at Peter in our text today, we see that he showed strong faith, if only for a brief moment in the face of a strong storm. We know this story. Uh, this is the story of Jesus walking on the water, following the story of the feeding of the 5,000. For a second time, the disciples are, are faced with a situation which, which they much, must initially try to cope try to cope with on their own. Have you ever tried to cope with something on your own without God's help? <laughs> but then Jesus comes to the rescue and saves them through this sovereign act of authority. And this story is, a, is like Matthew 8, 23 through 27, where a storm threatened to sink the boat while Jesus slept. We know that story too. In that story, Jesus rebuked the winds and the sea and they obeyed him. In both stories, the disciples are in a boat. In both stories, there's a sense that Jesus is absent from them. In our text, Matthew 14, he sends the disciples ahead by themselves. And in Matthew 8, he was in the boat with them, but he was fast asleep. So in both stories, the disciples are caught in a storm. And afraid, the disciples are amazed at Jesus' power. In the Matthew 8 story, they said, What kind of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And in our story, they say, You are truly the Son of God. So Matthew is writing at a time when Christians are being persecuted. By this time, Peter was most likely had been crucified, and the two storm stories address issues of anger, fear, and faith. And isn't that where we are today? Uh, uh, people everywhere, everyone, black people, white people are fearful, and our faith is being tested. In both stories, the boat represents the church confronted by temptations, trials, persecution. In both stories, Jesus appears as the church's champion who is strong enough to save those who call on him in faith. And this passage brought great comfort to the early Christians, and it should bring comfort to us as well. And while not spared suffering and death, they were confident that Christ would save them even if they were to die. Jesus makes, takes, makes the disciples get into the boat and go to the other side, and, and they are obedient, and we should be obedient as well. The difficulties that they experience on the sea are not of their own making, but come from their compliance with Jesus' command. He told them, go get into the boat. In other words, if, if it is of God's doing, then we have nothing to fear. God is moving in our lives. God is still in control, and we have no need to fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Verse 23 says, he went up into the mountain by himself to pray. And there is a lesson for us right there. We, we need to go to our prayer closet today as often as we can. Uh, there's great power in the solitude of praying to an almighty God. If you don't have a prayer closet, just kneel wherever you have a table or stool or your bed. And, and rather than remaining with the crowd, after the great feed, Jesus dismisses them and goes up to the mountain to pray. John 6.15 tells us that Jesus withdraws because the crowd wants to take him by force and make him a king. It is possible that he sends the disciples ahead so that they can't get caught up in the king-making efforts. And truly, great leaders are not caught up in being the king or dictators. They are servant leaders who look to God for direction in all that they do. So here we are. The boat was now in the middle of the sea, distressed by the waves because the wind was contrary. 
the strong contrary wind was not blowing in the right direction. It was against them. Have you ever had to face a, a contrary wind? A, a contrary wind would be when you find yourself alone fighting for a cause. A, a contrary wind would be when your body fails you despite all that you have done. A, a contrary wind would be when you got laid off from from your job of 25 years and, 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 and no pension. A contrary wind could be when things just don't go your way. Life does not always turn out the way we plan. If everything was like we planned, we would all probably be millionaires on an island somewhere right now. If things turned out the way we planned. <laughs> it is possible that we often encounter storms in life because of God's leading. When things are going well, money in the bank, relationship going well, we're a picture of good health. We may not think that we need God so much. Why do I need God? Everything's going right for me. We may even think that our success is all due to us. Oh, God. Oh, God. But when we get in trouble, we know how to call on Jesus' name. We, when we get in trouble, Lord, help me right now. I, I remember one time I, I was having a medical challenge and I, 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 everything turned yellow and the only name I could call was Jesus. And that was the only name I needed to call because when I said Jesus, my girlfriend called. She came to see about me. Jesus, almighty God. <laughs> <clears throat> So the disciples were compelled to go into the storm, and Jesus knew that a storm was coming. It wasn't an accident. You didn't take him by surprise, right? And sometimes we need to have a storm or a contrary wind to grow us in our faith walk. Why do we need that? To, so we can be reminded that it is not all about us, that we're not the ones in control, but that God is in control. So this is where... The disciples now find themselves. Uh, imagine how frightening it is to be in a small boat far from shore in a storm. A and then in the fourth watch of the night, which is 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., given the big day that they had feeding all these people, now you're in a strong storm. We know they were exhausted. So then he Jesus comes to them walking on the sea, walking on water. And to have command over the sea is only God's prerogative, right? None of us are out there trying to walk on water or the Detroit River. No, no. <laughs> so here it is, three between three and six. And here comes Jesus. He he comes to them and scriptures of uh, the Hebrew scriptures tells us of God walking on what God walking on water or making a way through the water for the Israelites but never of a man walking on water so by walking on water Jesus does what only God can do and speaks with the voice of God I am God said to Moses I, I am who I am I am who I am I can walk on water. I can do whatever I want to do. So Matthew has identified Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. And this story reinforces that role. At the time of the writing of this gospel, Matthew's church is weathering a storm of persecution. Uh, these Christians are not in rebellion, but faithfully serving God just like I imagine you do here at Calvary, faithfully serving God Sunday after Sunday. And this is the story of disciples on the, on the sea. It therefore mirrors, it mirrors exactly the situation of Matthew's church. It holds a promise that Jesus comes to Christians, to us during the storm, and that the storm does not have the upper hand, that Christ is present with us in the storm, and he redeems us from the storm. And it has been said that we're either just out of a storm, we in a storm, or we getting ready to go into a storm. But the good news 
is that God is bigger than our storms. That is the good news. Now, that the fact that we all go through storms isn't really that important, and, and uh, what form these storms take, uh, contrary winds, and that's not even really that important, but what is important is how we react to them. Will we lean on our faith in God or not? Or we, will we try to work it out ourselves and fix that thing? How, how does that ever work for you? Never. And I realize that this story may question some of our deep held long beliefs. Did Jesus really walk on water? You may be asking that question in your head. But the real key big question is whether Jesus worked miracles. If he could heal the sick without medicine, feed hungry crowds with just a little bit of food, then, then there is no reason to believe that he could not walk on water. And if no miracles are true, then, then we must question the resurrection. Was he crucified? Did he die? Did he rise again? If the resurrection is false, then the core of our faith is hollow, and we might as well shut down the church and go home right now. Did I lose anybody? Of course, there's no way to prove conclusively that Jesus worked miracles except what the written words tell us. There were no videos back then. Everybody didn't have a, a phone with a camera on it recording everything like we do now. Belief in miracles and resurrection are a matter of strong faith, not proof. For we walk by faith and not by sight. The best evidence of miracles is by our own experience. The effect that these miracles, particularly the resurrection, had on the lives of the disciples who were the witnesses and the changes that we see in our own lives and the lives of others because of our, our relationship with Christ. How many of you have a testimony of what God has done for you? Anybody out there? Amen. Amen. I know that I am. Your, tell you my story some other time. Um, and I'm not the only one. Some of us should have been dead a long time ago, truth be told. Amen? Should have been dead and buried a long time, but the doctors gave up on you, and, but, but you kept on praying, and the church kept on praying and, and believing in a miracle-making God. And, and when it looked like you were going to be evicted, uh, the church kept on praying, and you kept on praying, and you showed up here today and, and, and just looking like you're not just surviving, but you're thriving. And, and praise be to God, because otherwise we would not be here. So back to the disciples. They were not so much afraid of the storm, but when they saw Jesus walking on water, they cried out in fear. Sometimes God has to come into our life in such a way that we can't help but know that that is God moving in our lives. That's God speaking to us, Jesus walking on the water. They said, it's a ghost. Uh, they knew about storms, but they didn't know anything about a man walking on water. They had never seen that. And Jesus responds, cheer up, it is I. Don't be afraid. Have courage. Be of good cheer. It is I, which literally means again, I am. He is the son of God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And this story reassures Matthew's church that even in the midst of persecution, they need not fear because Jesus is present with them. And it offers the same assurance to us in times of illness, death, persecution, unrest in the world. It prepares us for times when things are going badly or going well. Adversity is not a sign of God's displeasure, nor is prosperity necessarily a sign of God's pleasure. Wealth does not equate to God's favor, nor poverty to God's disfavor. Illness is not a sign of adequate, inadequate faith, nor health a sign of good faith. Stop saying, you know, to people, oh, who sinned? Why are they suffering so much? We don't know what God has planned. 
Jesus says that God makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. God says, my ways are not your ways and, and, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. They say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Now, I can testify to that. I'm much stronger than I used to be. When things go bad, and I'm going to wrap this up in a minute, we are in a strong storm, then our hearts are much more receptive to receiving Jesus. A broken heart is often a door through which Christ can find entry. He still comes to us in the midst of our troubles saying, cheer up, it is I. Don't be afraid, for I am with you always, even unto death. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the waters. And this story, though short, uh, has many parts that we can identify it with. It is, in part, a story of Peter. We know, we know Peter. He leaps before he looks. And Peter suddenly becomes aware of his predicament and then falters. And it is, in part, uh, also the story of a man testing God. Peter begins by saying, Lord, if it is you, remember like the devil was tempting God, if you are the son of God, jump. Then Peter s says, command me to come to you on the waters. And he again echoes the def devil's challenge, command these stones to become bread. You remember that. It is in part the story of Peter, the disciple, telling the master what to do. However, it is also the story in part of a disciple asking permission from the master. Peter asks for a command and acts only once the command is given. It, it, it is uh, in part a bridge story between the despair of the fearful disciples of verse 26 and the faith of the worshipful, worshipful disciples of the verse. It is the story of Matthew's church, fearful and confused, looking for something to hold on to in the midst of suffering. But in its larger context, it is the story of every Christian. It is our story too, as we move back and forth between doubt and faith, doubt and faith, sometimes focus on the storm, sometimes focus on Jesus. For Peter, this is a moment of both weakness and strength. He doubts, but wants to believe. He fears, but steps out of a perfectly good boat in the middle of the night into a storm. He doubts, but then he, he wants to believe. Lord, I believe, now help my unbelief. Peter calls out, Lord, save me. He expresses strong faith even though his fear is there. A strong storm requires strong faith. Jesus says, come. We don't know how far he walked out, but when he falters and he is close enough to Jesus that Jesus can reach out and catch him. Jesus says, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Note that he first saves Peter, and then he rebukes him. It's important to note that while Jesus is disappointed with Peter's inadequate faith, like I'm sure he, we disappoint him from time to time, G, uh, Peter has acted in greater, stronger faith than the other disciples. At least Peter got out of the boat. At least Peter got out of the boat. Peter is paradoxically a model of both faith and lack of faith. His lack of faith is caused by a failure to concentrate. He's distracted by the fierce wind, and we too get distracted by what is going on in the news, MSNBC. I know I'm guilty of that. ABC Nightly News. Come on, somebody. Uh, Facebook friends trying to see what everybody else is doing and, and other social media. The world, we take our eyes off of Jesus. 
Peter's mind became more affected by his circumstances. And that is what, that's what gets us today. We get more affected by the circumstances than, than we lean on our faith and the power of Jesus. Once again, he became filled with fear. Sometimes we will have to do it afraid. Sometimes we have to feel the fear and go back to school. Even if you're at advanced age, come on somebody. Uh, sometimes we have to feel the fear and go for that promotion that we've been wanting for 10, 15 years. Sometimes we got to feel the fear and run for political office. Feel the fear and start a business. Sometimes we got to feel that fear and do it anyway. At least Peter got out of the boat. He took some action, and that's what we must do today. What can we do? March, when you see an injustice. If you can't march, write your congressperson. Speak up. If you can't speak out loud, you can pray daily for deliverance from your current circumstance. Organize, have a meeting, give food assistance to those in need, tutor some students, visit the sick, vote. We can all do something to fight a contrary wind. Finally, when they got up into the boat, the wind ceased. Just as Jesus has godly power over the water, so also he has godly power over the wind. And to the extent that this is a parable of Matthew's persecuted church, the stilled wind still stands as a promise, a promise to us that persecution shall eventually cease. Uh, uh, we know that trouble does not last always, and this too shall pass, that a, a brighter day is coming if we just trust and believe in the God of our fathers and mothers. Those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, you are truly the Son of God. Be encouraged today, beloved. Get out of the boat of low expectations. Get out of the boat of being too passive, low self-esteem. Get out of the boat of apathy and old traditions and fear. Get out of the boat of doubt, depression, or whatever small boat you are in. Get out of that boat or be left behind. Don't miss this moment in history. The winds are blowing fierce, and you don't want to be left behind. Peter started off afraid, and I'm almost done, walking by faith. But he took his eyes off Jesus. Only take that leap of faith also if God says so. It isn't about how big the situation and circumstances appear. Peter lost sight of what was important. The main lesson here is who Jesus is. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the resurrection and the life. And anyone who believes in me, though they were dead, yet shall they live. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. I am the true vine. I am who I am. I am. What kind of faith do you have? Either you believe God or you don't. And we must remember that no matter how strong the storm appears, we must have even strong faith. We serve a God who's able to keep us from falling if we keep our mind and our sights on him. We've come this far by faith, leaning on his everlasting arms. God has not failed us yet. I'm going all the way with Jesus. I don't know whose boat you want to be in, but Jesus is my Savior, and I just came to tell you as I end this, I don't know what kind of storm you're in. I'm going to share this short thing with you, and then I'm going to close. I want you to know that some people are really suffering in this season we're in. I was at Meyer, Meyer store, grocery store. You know, I'm always trying to get fresh groceries. And a young man came up to me and said, excuse me, ma'am, would you... Bless me. 
He said, I just tried to commit suicide. And I sell perfume. And you know, all kind of thoughts run through your mind is like, does he, when he approached me, does he want money from me? What does he want from me? But when he said he tried to commit suicide, then I noticed that he had a medical ban on his arm. Why he approached me, I didn't know him from Adam. How did he know I was a minister? I don't know, but this is how God works. So I stopped in my tracks and I began to pray out loud for him right in the middle of Meyer's store. I don't know who heard the prayer, but I know he needed the prayer. So what I'm telling you, that some people are really, really hurting and they're looking for us to help them as they are in a storm. Beloved, everyone here today has some type of need. Today, I don't know what type of storm you may be facing. Maybe it's all good in your life, and if so, God bless you. <laughs> but for those who may be facing a storm, I do know how you can get through it. Unconditional faith in God. Trust in God. He knows all about you, and he doesn't need any help from us. You may have started out great like Peter, but now you've been distracted by the world. We can't afford to have wishy-washy, sometimey faith. That's not going to get us anywhere in the world that we live in today. Oh, the storms keep on raging in my life. And sometimes it's hard to tell night from day. Still that hope that lies within is reassured as I keep my eyes on the distant shore. I know he'll lead me safely to that blessed place he has prepared. But if the storms don't cease and if the winds keep blowing, my soul has been anchored in the Lord. My soul has been anchored in the Lord. My soul has been anchored in the Lord. Thank you, Lord. When the storms of life are raging, we must have strong faith. If you came here today looking to be help and realizing it's time for you to get out the boat, it's later than you think. Now is a good time as we open up the doors of the church I would say, choose faith over fear. I would say, if you're in that boat and you say, Lord, help me, I promise you, he will reach out and he'll touch you and he'll bring you close. God has never denied anybody who came to him in faith and trust. Lord, God, help me. He's never going to turn you down. Come to God. Come to Jesus while you still can. Come to Jesus right now. Today is a good time to turn your life over. Your little small boat is getting a little rocky out there by yourself. Come to Jesus right now while you still can. He'll lift you up. Turn your life around, my neighbor. <laughs> Get to know him. It's all about relationship. Right now. Right now, come. Praise God. Just come. It's a short walk down the aisle to change your life forever. To change your life. Take that step. Come on out of the boat. And, and want you to see Jesus meet you wherever you are. And you might
might say, but you don't know my life. You know, I've done some things and other that. It doesn't matter. <laughs> that was your old life. <laughs> you turn into a new life now. And all it takes is a step down the aisle. Praise God.